screen share set up here. All right. And okay. Yeah, hey everyone, I'm Heather, and I'm excited to get to talk to you tonight about dependent evangelism. And so God had actually given me this title and subheading um, before all this crazy stuff happened in the world. So I just have to take a moment to sit and think about how, just how dependent we all are on God right now and actually how weary the world must be as well. Um, I also just think it's really cool that I get to talk about evangelism with uh, Easter being on. Uh, yeah, in Eric Shoemaker's book that we talked about two weeks ago, I was reminded that um, women were actually the first evangelists that got to know about Christ rising from the dead. So that's pretty cool because I'm a girl. <laughs> um, but yeah, first, I have some pictures to share. So I wouldn't normally put up so many pictures, but I just really miss seeing all of your faces, and I'm sure that you do too. So my first shout out goes to our J team that uh, Dean and I got to host in our living room this spring. So photo credit to Sarah Altenhofen. She was super helpful helping out um, at our site as well. And we, we all love Jesus. We also realize that we all love crazy socks. So that <laughs> um, explains that second picture there. Uh, next, I just have a few of the many faces that I miss seeing. Uh, there wasn't nearly enough room on this slide. And yes, sometimes it blows people's minds that I'm John White Ben White's sister. Um, so if that blows your mind. Um, yeah, and I also have a quick random tribute to Faith Sanchez. Because um, ever since the summer training program last summer, uh, her and I just have this random thing where I, I take random candid photos of her. Um, so I just thought I'd share a few to just make you smile. Love you, Faith. I'm sure a lot of us love Faith as well. Um, yeah, and then here's some lovely, lovely faces you may miss. Uh, this was taken one Friday. Some of our staff team got to go bowling together. So yes, we love doing fun things. And then uh, finally, just a little bit more about me. Uh, there's Dean and I enjoying the Garden of the Gods. Uh, some of you may know uh, for watching me after nearly every single nav night and afterwards that I love to dance. So whenever we play the music at the end, I'm just all over the place dancing. So I also teach cardio dance uh, at North Ames Fitness Center. So that's that center photo there. And then um, on the side, you can see uh, I'm a dietitian. So that was kind of what <laughs> Daniel was alluding to. And so in that photo, I'm actually standing with the inventor of Icelandic yogurt. Um, and his name is Siggy, and so is his brand of fancy dairy. So that was at a conference that I got to attend. Um, so back to what we came to hear about tonight. Um, yeah, so dependent evangelism and giving the hope of heaven to a weary, weary world. So I just thought I would start with a couple quick definitions that I thought would be helpful, starting with the gospel. So you may have heard it to mean glad tidings or good news. Uh, Dean and I were just talking about it as I was preparing, and he kind of restated it to be the good story or anything that broadly communicates the redemption of the world by God. <laughs> um, so I just really loved that and really got me thinking. Um, yeah, this past year, I just really feel like God has been calling me back to the gospel and showing me that it is the single thing that the entire Bible is about. Um, and I just put a, put a few cross reference there in the corner of the slide to show what I mean. Um, that the Bible, the gospel of the Bible starts way before those four books that we call the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So in Genesis 3.15, um, we see God's promise to Eve that her offspring would one day crush the serpent's head, aka Satan, who caused her and her husband Adam to sin. And this is fulfilled in Jesus. The beginning of Genesis 12, we see God's promise to Abraham that in him and his family line, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And guys, this is also fulfilled in Jesus because he's in the line of Abraham. In 2 Samuel 7, we see God's promise to David that his offspring would have an everlasting kingdom and that his throne would be established forever. Also fulfilled in Jesus, as he's in the line of David. And then those last three, um, we just kind of see more directly referencing Jesus in the prophecy of his birth in Isaiah, the direct promise to Mary in Luke 2, and then also kind of the summary of the famous John 3, 16 through 18 passage of the fulfillment of that promise. So there's, guys, there's so many other uh, verses that I could point to, but I would just challenge you to look for them as well as you read the word. Um, 
And this kind of gets into my next slide, but I just think it's vitally important for every Christian that we would know what the main message of the gospel is. And I would even challenge us that we'd be able to share that within like 30 to 60 seconds <laughs> um, with somebody else that was asking us about it. Um, and so this is actually asked of Dean and I during our church membership interview at Grand Ave. And I just really appreciated that. So I actually wrote out a quick sample to just share with you guys. Um, so I'll just read that for you. So Jesus is the son of God sent to earth through the Virgin Mary. He lived a perfect life when we couldn't die to death that we in our sin deserve. And he was raised on the third day, defeating sin and death. He did this out of love for us and to save us, giving us the hope of eternal life, that when we confess with our mouth that he is the, our Lord and Savior and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. Uh, so I kind of get a little long-winded, just like Paul sometimes. Um, but just to restate that, Jesus, he lived a perfect life for us. He died on the cross for our sins. And when we believe in him, that um, we can have eternal life with him. And when we confess him to be our Lord, we are with him in heaven forever. Um, yeah, and that thing, the part that I read, I did put it at the end of the presentation um, in some extra slides and uh, references that I have for you. So my point with this slide before we move on is that the Bible is about the gospel um, from beginning to end. And we can see that all throughout it. Um, yeah, so that's a beautiful thing. So the next definition that I love to walk through is evangelism pretty helpful also for this topic. Um, yeah, one helpful article that I found defined evangelism as teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade. Um, I just think that's right on. Um, my slides will actually be sent out after this, and so I hyperlinked the articles um, so you can check them out for yourself in those author titles there. So J. Max Stiles went on to say that if any of these four elements of evangelism are missing, then it's not true evangelism. Uh, yeah, uh, if we're not teaching, then what are we doing? And if it's not about the gospel, then what are we talking about? <laughs> and these last two really convict me. If I'm not sharing the gospel with the aim to persuade, am I really helping those who I'm sharing with actually respond to Christ? Um, yeah, we want to do more than just share information. We want to actually give others the opportunity to welcome Christ into their life. And the other article is from the North American Mission Board. I don't have time to fully talk about it, but it's short and powerful and definitely worth a read. But one point I just wanted to highlight from it is how evangelism is out of overflowing joy and freedom that believers have in Christ. Thinking about places in the Bible to talk about evangelism, I just put down nearly the entire book of Acts. Um, it's been so cool to study this semester as a campus, and um, I actually spent time to collect all of the passages and verses in Acts where the gospel is either being shared or being talked about being shared, and I found at least one verse in every chapter. So um, I actually also listed those references in a slide um, at the end of my presentation and the extra resources. Yeah, one other point about evangelism that I'd like to talk about before we move on is that it's what Jesus was about. So, I mean, he is the good news, and once he began his ministry, he spent a lot of time preaching. So I'll just have a few verses to kind of talk about this. So, um, yeah, in the beginning of Mark, we see that as he begins his, his ministry, his, Jesus' message is repent and believe the good news. Later on in that same chapter, Jesus tells his disciples that preaching is why he came. He just flat tells us why he came. It was one of the reasons that he came. Um, yeah, and then zooming ahead to Jesus' last words before he ascends into heaven, um, he tells his disciples to wait in the city until they are clothed with power from on high. So we're kind of like, hmm, what does this mean? Or what are, what are they waiting for? What is this power for? Um, and so we see in Acts 1.8 that this power is the Holy Spirit, and it is for witnessing. It's for them to be his witnesses to the end of the earth. And so this is such a cool thing, guys, um, that Jesus is about preaching the good news, and he is the good news. Um, and so I don't know if about you guys, but if that's what Jesus is about, that's what I want to be about, too. So, yeah, our main passage for tonight will be out of 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, so keep your Bibles handy, but I'll also have it on the screen. Um, but before we dig into it, um, I just had a verse to share. Um, yeah, I just feel like this verse just really sums up how I feel about getting to do this 
Nav Night Talk with you guys. I'm just so grateful to have the opportunity of sharing these things with you. And I do really feel like in preparing for this talk that God has done something for my soul. Um, I think it's truly a testament to his glory and just the miraculous ways that he works in that like a Bible reading plan that I started like over a year ago has been aligned to prepare me for this talk. Um, yeah, what a cool thing it has been um, that a lot of my preparation has just been reading back through my journal and my Bible study notes with studying Acts. And yeah, with that said, thank you so much to all of you for tuning in. Um, just to give some context for where we're going to start in verse 12, I just wanted to talk about verses 1 through 11. So just highlight a quick few, few quick things. Um, verses 1 through 6 of chapter 3, Paul's just driving home this point that um, our sufficiency comes from God um, and not from ourselves. So we'll really want to remember this uh, because it may come up later as we think about application and it's just really, a really solid truth, bedrock truth, um, just for our faith in general. So I summarized uh, verses 7 through 11. It's a little bit confusing, but it just is kind of this comparison of covenants. That is the covenant of Moses and the law with the new covenant that we have um, in Jesus. And you can check out Exodus 34 to find this kind of crazy, amazing story <laughs> of Moses meeting with the Lord on top of Mount Sinai to receive the law and his face literally shining so brightly, like physically shining as he came down from the mountain afterwards, that he had to put a veil over his face not to blind the people. So kind of crazy. But what Paul is saying about this is that this new covenant that we have in Jesus, we have far more hope and God has far greater glory than even Moses's face shining um, in, with the covenant of the law. So let me pray and then we will read the passage and talk about it. Yeah, dear Lord, I just want to thank you for your word um, that is living and active and for your Holy Spirit that um, causes us to understand it and helps us to know what it's saying. I just want to pray that you would grant us all focus, um, even over this video call as we read your word um, and think about what it says, God. Would you just give me the words to say to encourage all of us in just, yeah, engage, faithfully sharing your truth and um, in evangelism that is dependent on you. I ask all of this in your name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to read the passage for us, um, and I just wanted to throw an idea out there, if it's helpful for you, that you could close your eyes as I read, if that's helpful to focus, but you don't have to, just, just, a, um, just a suggestion. So let me go. All right, since we have such a hope, we are very bold not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. All right. So I, this is a great passage. <laughs> I love this passage. Um, I just have three main ideas that I would like to draw out of this passage in reference to evangelism. 
So I'll go through each of them here and then we'll kind of take a look at what verses kind of point to each truth. So the first point is that the reality of spiritual blindness of those who don't know Jesus. And so this may be a new idea to you, but I just think it's really evident in this passage. So we'll kind of take a look at that together. Uh, next, I'm excited to talk about God's light and our knowledge of him and our spiritual sight. So God gives us light so that we're able to see him um, trumping the spiritual blindness of the devil. And lastly, both of these truths of spiritual blindness and our personal experience of God's light lead us to have hope and confidence in him as we grasp the power of dependent prayer, um, and along with openly sharing truth and evangelism. So kind of a lot in that last one, but um, we'll kind of break it down as we go. So first we'll look at the verses that point to the reality of spiritual blindness. Phrases that jumped out to me talked about this veil that remains unlifted and that lies over the hearts of those who don't see the hope of the glory of the new covenant that we have in Jesus. In chapter four, Paul goes on to say that even now as he's talking to the Corinthians, as he's writing this letter to them, that his gospel may be veiled to those who are perishing. And that the God of this world, aka Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the gospel. So I, I looked up in Blue Outer Bible um, the definition of this word blinded that's being used. And it, I found it to mean that Satan is literally blunting the mental discernment or darkening the minds of those who don't believe and are unable to believe. He's, he's causing that unbelief. And so this literally means that they, they couldn't see or understand the gospel if they wanted to. And if someone's been blinded, they can't will themselves to see. And we can't will that to happen either. So I just want to let that sink in because these are some pretty strong statements. Um, yeah, so just a few seconds before we move on, um, I just wanted to think about these couple questions. Is spiritual blindness a new idea to you? And if so, and yeah, whether or not it is or not, how does this change the, how you view the lost, how you view those people that don't know Jesus? Um, yeah, and that they physically can't <laughs> without... Um, yeah, without God's light that we're about to talk about. So just some food for thought on that one. And yeah, with this last question, maybe what was once frustration or judgment um, in our minds towards those not walking with Jesus around us can transform into the deep compassion that Jesus has for the sheep who are without a shepherd. So moving on to God's light in our sight and the verses that point to that. Um, we see that only through Christ is this veil that we talked about is taken away. And when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And guys, I just love the verse, this verse six in chapter four, that it is God who shines light on our hearts to allow us to see him. And for us who see God and know Christ, we have each uniquely experienced this phenomenon in coming to know him. The veil was removed for us, guys. So cool. <laughs> um, so I just have a couple uh, extra verses on this next slide to just show the similar idea of how God has the power to open minds and hearts of people and to allow them to understand and know him. Basically, like we were saying, trumping the spiritual blindness of the devil. Um, yeah, so in Luke 24, uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples after his resurrection. And it says that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. <laughs> Pretty cool. In Acts 16, it's described that the Lord opened, it's talking about Lydia, opened Lydia's heart to pay attention to what Paul was saying as he shared the gospel. So a really crazy thing about the Blue Letter def Bible definition of the word opened here, that in Luke 24, it's talking about um, Jesus literally caused the understanding of his disciples. Just let that sink in. He caused them to understand. And in Acts 16, it's the direct like definition of it is that the Lord roused Lydia's soul. Like, I just think of this <laughs> when I think of that. Um, and so my point with these definitions here is that we serve a very powerful God who can literally open minds and rouse souls. And guys, he's the only one who can. So I want to let this uh, sink in that to God alone belongs the power of conversion. 
Yeah, and I think this is a really freeing thing because it doubly affirms that our sufficiency comes from God and that he is sovereign even in our evangelism efforts as we depend on him. And I also want to pose this question that if we truly believe that he has this power, how does this change the way that we think about the role of prayer in evangelism? Does this stir us to plead for the souls of others because he is the only one who can save? And guys, do we pray for him to further open our minds and spiritual understanding to be able to share the gospel in such a way that causes people to respond to it? And so I think these first two points of the reality of spiritual blindness and then the reality of God's power to take that away lead to our third point of our hope and confidence in him. We are able to be bold because we have already received spiritual sight and have personally experienced the transformation that comes from beholding him like we see in verse 18. He has given us the ministry of being his witnesses to the ends of the earth out of his mercy, guys, because in all reality, he could do it without us, but he longs to do it with us to the praise of his glory. Um, we do not lose heart, but we openly share truth as we proclaim him and not ourselves. So to summarize this last point, uh, we have personally experienced his transforming power and we believe in him. And we long for others to also experience what, we've, what we have and also believe in him. So we pray for others and we openly share truth with them, the gospel, um, while trusting in Jesus um, and his Holy Spirit to change hearts. So what does dependent evangelism actually look like? So I thought I would start with what it isn't. So dependent evangelism isn't trusting in our own sufficiency to win souls. We kind of talked about this earlier, that God alone can change hearts, and so we get to depend on him in prayer, um, in evangelism. And yeah, we kind of looked at that as well in the beginning of chapter three. There's those verses there as well, that bedrock truth. Um, the second one I kind of summed up as it's not all walk and no talk. Um, when we read passages like Romans 10, 14 through 17, it's made quite clear that someone can't believe unless they hear the word of Christ. Um, and that someone has to be sent to them for that word to be explicitly shared with them. Yeah, it's this beautiful chain of how, how can someone believe if they've never heard? How can they hear if no one has preaching it to them? And how can someone preach unless they're sent? Um, and so Jesus sent us um, into the world to preach the good news. So I do believe that we can show the love of Christ through our actions and that we should. Um, but we must also openly share the truth of the hope that we have in dependent evangelism. These last two points of what dependent evangelism isn't kind of go together. Um, it isn't an act that earns God's favor, and it isn't or shouldn't be recruiting others to our own anxious standards. I'll kind of explain that one a little bit. Um, so I've heard it stated that what we win people with is what we win them to. So I think this kind of applies here. If I'm sharing the gospel out of a checkbox mentality, and quite honestly, out of anxiety that I'm not doing enough, I might not be gripping the truth of the gospel deep down and for myself. Um, and I'm simply recruiting other people to an anxious standard that I've created for myself. Um, and this is not the beauty of the freedom that we have in Christ. Guys, this is something I've personally wrestled with um, just in, yeah, in dependent evangelism <laughs> and trying to be more dependent in evangelism. So what is dependent evangelism? I think it can look like fervent prayer and trust for God to cause understanding, rouse souls, and change hearts. It is walking and talking, serving others, and speaking direct truth of the gospel. And finally, dependent evangelism is done out of being fully secure of our identity in Christ as we offer freedom to others because we ourselves have been set free. So doesn't this all just sound wonderful? <laughs> like, if this was how it looked, like, that'd be great. And we, we want to pray for that. We want to plead that God would make this more true in our lives. But quite honestly, guys, I know evangelism is really hard. Um, so hard that some believers do lose heart. Um, or maybe some have never shared the name of Jesus with someone else. Um, yeah, and I think our world tells us that Jesus and our, our faith is this personal thing to kind of keep to ourselves. Maybe the, you know, the occasional thing on social media about it. But um, this is not to, the fact of keeping it to ourselves is not the calling and command of Jesus that we see in scripture. Um, yeah, 
if you've been around um, just Christian community enough, you, you're probably familiar with Matthew 28, 18 through 20 of the Great Commission that Jesus says to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And what's really cool about even that Great Commission, guys, is that it's, it shows the dependence in it. Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So, so yeah, recognizing that um, it's not always just sunshine and rainbows <laughs> of a dependent evangelism, it's, it's hard. Um, I just wanted to walk through a few obstacles together to kind of find a way forward in all of this. So these first two, I hope we've kind of started to address today that how we view the lost and how we view our role and God's role in the solution really matter. Um, yeah, it's kind of like more how we think about evangelism and how um, yeah, that, that, that if that is wrong, you know, or, you know, if we have skewed views or different ideas about that, that how can we then engage in evangelism when, you know, our thinking is not the same as what God's thinking is. Um, yeah, and so if we misdiagnose the quote unquote problem that we see in others' unbelief, we might just think, oh, they just have bad ideas disease and I need to bring better arguments or better ideas to them. Um, or maybe we even think that they're beyond saving, um, that we're not seeing the lost as God sees them. And secondly, um, if we think that it's either completely up to us to, to save people or completely up to God to save others, both of these are skewed views. That he, the truth is that he has given us the, this ministry of reconciliation by his mercy and that we can trust him to open minds and rouse souls as we faithfully share truth. Yeah, I think those verses that I shared about him being able to open minds, guys, that's just like fuel for prayer for other people that we would pray that and plead that he would do that. Um, so we'll get to do that a little bit later. Um, but I'll just, yeah, walk through a few other obstacles for us that are kind of more the, yeah, rubber meets the road type uh, obstacles. So these are some that you may have experienced or may be experiencing now. Um, one, the first one being that you might not feel like you know how to share the gospel, or you may not feel like you are, know enough about the Bible or are qualified to do so. So let me just say that, man, do we as the navigators have some tools <laughs> that we can share with you? Um, I actually um, put some of them at the end of the presentation and some of the extra, extra slides. And so if, yeah, if you have questions like, we can set up, I also put my email there, and so we can set up a call to talk about that. And if you feel like that would be helpful for you to have a tool of some sort to share. Um, but I actually don't think that it's all about becoming a professional evangelist. Uh, Charles Spurgeon describes evangelism as one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Um, and so remember that your sufficiency does come from God, no matter how you share the hope that you have with other people. And so these next three are also very real obstacles. I mean, how do we share the gospel if we don't know anyone who has yet to know Jesus? Um, and we can often feel like we don't have time. Or we don't feel this to be a priority in our lives, but the tyranny of the urgent, just constantly feeling like there's other things that are, are more important um, and that the world tells us are more important, quite honestly. Maybe we even fear rejection or ruining a relationship. So in all three of these, I would just ask you to pray um, independence on God, that he would bring unbelieving friends into your life, all the while pursuing opportunities for faithfully pursuing that for yourself as well, and getting to know people as Jesus did. Um, that, pray that God would change your heart to be more like his and his deep care for every soul. As reflected in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says that the Lord does not wish that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And as C.S. Lewis put it, we have never met a mere mortal. Um, in, in not bringing up the name of Jesus, others carry on an indifference towards spiritual things. Uh, would you ask God to make you willing to be a fork in the road, um, that people would meet you and um, just know Christ through you? So I think in a little bit, we're going to break up into groups for some discussion and prayer. So I'll quick give you a preview of those questions. And guests, you can feel free to stay on to see the questions and I'll let you know um, when to log off. So thanks for being with us. I'm so excited that you're able to be here. Um, so the first question that we'll talk about is, what are my thoughts and feelings about sharing my faith with others? Um, and what obstacles do I feel? Next, what role has prayer played in evangelism for me personally? 
And then how might God be ripening his harvest field during this pandemic? Um, and how can I be praying for that? So um, we'll have those on a document for you. So don't worry about writing them down. So spoiler though, for the last <laughs> um, part of this question is that I have a prayer tool to share with you guys. Um, we actually use this during our Joshua team and praying for the people that we are inviting like evangelistically to r read the Bible with us along with praying for our own heart, you kind of see the two sides of the tool, um, praying for, yeah, that God would give them spiritual sight, but would I also just see them as God sees them? Um, yeah, in love, sharing truth. So, so yeah, we will use this in groups um, to pray as well. And so I would just, uh, it says it kind of on the sheet, but aim for like 10 minutes of discussion with the first three questions and then 10 minutes of prayer, excuse me, and um, maybe assign the order of prayer so it doesn't get awkward. I know we're all kind of adjusting to the online um, thing. So in closing, um, I just wanted to read um, a couple sections from 2 Corinthians 4 and 5. And I want you to invite you to reflect on these verses, kind of in light of everything that we just talked about from chapters 3 and 4, returning to these three main ideas. The re reality of spiritual blindness, guys, the lost really are lost. And would we see them as God sees them in that way? Um, that God has light of knowledge of him, and that is powerful, and it causes our spiritual sight. Um, and yeah, that we've personally experienced that, and how that leads to our hope and confidence in him as we experience his transforming power and long for others too as well just in praying for them and in sharing the gospel with them yeah so feel free to close your eyes again if that was helpful but i'll just start in second corinthians 4 i put the references up there for you but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to god and not to us so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Therefore, Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Yeah, thanks again for tuning in. And remember to check out some of the additional articles and resources that I've put. Guys, there's just so much. Like I was kind of saying, God has just been speaking to me so much about this topic. And there was so, only so much I could put in this presentation. So you'll find, yeah, those references from Acts I was talking about, some articles about seeing the gospel through the whole Bible that are really cool. Um, some extra questions to be wrestling with about how we view um, the gospel and sharing it with other people. And then all of those tools for dependent evangelism um, as well, along with my email. So I think that's it. Let me see here. I have to figure out how to 